So uh, welcome everybody to this afternoon's TRI Sustainability Symposium. And I'm really quite excited about uh, the speakers that we've got lined up to address what is a really uh, very, very important issue. I think um, just by way of introduction, um, many of us are increasingly becoming aware of, of the importance of climate change, the importance of uh, the effects that this is going to have on the world at large, on healthcare, on vulnerable populations across the world. And the, the, the next question I guess having having become aware and and energized that this is really a serious problem the next issue is well look what can I do there are clearly some uh, many things that need to be done at a macro level uh, at, at at an international level at a country by country uh, level but there are also things that we need to think about that we what we, we will need to do ourselves as individuals and as uh, institutions as scientists, as researchers, as healthcare workers. And that's, that's essentially the motivation for uh, this, a this afternoon seminar. I can see that most of you are joining online. There's a small number of people here in the auditorium uh, enjoying the freedom of being able to meet face to face for the first time in quite a while. Um, before I go any further, look, I'd just like to acknowledge uh, the traditional custodians of the country on which we meet and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to elders past, present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today, and particularly to the Jagera and Turbul people uh, of the land on which we meet. So we have four speakers um, who will be giving presentations from a variety of viewpoints. Uh, can I ask that we hold questions uh, to the end? We'll have a panel discussion uh, at the end and there'll be plenty of time to flesh out some of the uh, uh, perhaps areas of uncertainty, the controversies, uh, areas in which you'd like to go into, few, into greater depth about some, some of the issues. So uh, without further ado, I, I'd like to in introduce our first speaker, Professor Kerry Wilson from QUT. Kerry is the Pro Vice Chancellor for the Sustainability Strategy uh, at QUT, and she's also an affiliate pro professor at the University of Copenhagen. She was previously the Executive Director of the QUT Institute for Future Environment and the Director of the ARC Centre of Excellence for Environmental Decisions. Uh, she's an Australian Natural Sciences Commissioner for UNESCO, a member of the Australian Heritage Council and the Great Barrier Reef 2050 Plan Independent Expert Panel. She's had a couple of decades of experience leading and conducting research, particularly in this area. She's got interests in applied resource allocation problems, uh, particularly how do we go about investing limited resources to protect and re restore biodiversity. Kerry's had a number of prestigious national awards uh, in the past, including the Prime Minister's Prize for Life Scientists of the Year and the Australian Academy of Science, Nancy Millis Medal for Women in Science. So without further ado, um, Kerry, we're, we're really interested to hear your presentation around sustainability views and actions in a university setting. Great, thanks John for the um, introduction and thank you for the opportunity to present today. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the uh, tr traditional owners of the lands where I stand today, the Turbul and Yuguru people, and I acknowledge the important roles that they play within our community uh, and also the, the great deal we can learn from their care for country and sustainable practices. I've been um, asked to talk today about the role um, universities in particular can play in the sustainability transformation and, um, and obviously I'll talk um, about what QUT is doing in this space. Um, I'm keen to, to hear any feedback also and, um, and uh, handle any questions. Um, so I'm looking forward to, forward to that as well. So I'm just going to share my screen now, um, get my presentation up here. Let's see if I can get this to work. <clears throat> so now, let's just, 
So can you see the presentation view? No, you, you need no. to share the other one. Uh, I may have um, lost my skill there. So I, I'm going to just work through it. Um, despite our practice, I'll work through it just in the, the standard view, if that's okay. Um, of which you can see just a standard editing view, yep. correct? Yeah, okay. Well, I thought I had it sorted, but anyhow, I'm, I'm um, obviously with the floods, QUT's um, still closed its campus. So I'm just navigating a different type of setup here. Uh, anyhow, so uh, what, what's QUT doing specifically? Well, QUT um, has made sustainability and environment one of its seven strategic priorities. Um, obviously for, for an organization or institution such as university, that's a pretty high level um, statement that QUT wants to play a big role in, in shifting our university um, and Queensland and Australia and the world onto a more sustainable path. Um, with this recognition, we developed an institutional wide uh, sustainability action plan covering 13 areas, um, ranging from education obviously and research, but also to energy, water, waste and transportation. Um, and it also led to the creation of my role, which was, um, as John said, PVC uh, sustainability strategy. And it's worth noting that that's the only um, role of its type in Australia. And I've had the, um, the good fortune of now meeting two other similar roles internationally, um, which is fabulous. So sustainability, uh, I guess, cuts across everything um, we do at QUT and, and at other um, universities also. So obviously research and education, but also how we run ourselves and run our own operations and who we partner with and um, what we advocate for more broadly in society. So it's a wide scope and, um, and we're a small team. So that's by design because we need not only, um, I think for this agenda, senior leadership, um, responsible for sustainability within our institutions, but we also need leaders throughout our organisations. So here I've mapped out all my various points of contact um, into other parts of the university. Um, and there are um, demonstrated leadership um, roles within each of these areas that talk to sustainability also. Importantly, there's a, a, a connection here into the QUT Guild um, that's a student representative body um, through their environmental collective. So that's a really important component of this. Um, their students and our student group have the opportunity to um, dedicate their time to promoting environmental sustainability through their campus events and initiatives as well. <clears throat> so as I said, we've got a, a length, lengthy sustainability action plan <clears throat> and a set of policies around it. But um, I'm, I gen to gen generally like to have um, everything that we're approaching on a page and can be represented on a single page. Um, and here you can see, probably importantly, uh, our approach, I guess, or our philosophy, um, where we've outlined important aspects of sense of purpose and sense of place, but also that connection to um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, goals and visions as well. Importantly, um, I guess part of our philosophy is around transparency and accountability, and that's really important in the, in the sustainability agenda more broadly. Um, so there are four main areas where we're focusing uh, in our strategies, plans and policies. So going through each of those bit by bit and um, embedding sustainability. <laughs> also growing our um, sustainability research um, integrating sustainability into QUT education. So I'll talk a bit more about that shortly. That's a massive project. Um, and also reducing the environmental impact of our campuses and our operations. So before I go much further, I do think it's important that we kind of take a step back and get on the same page and what we're talking about in relation to sustainability. Um, and I guess I, I see it as being in kind of two camps. One, one camp that talks about the the relationship between human and nature um, and, and another that talks more about sustainability development. Um, 
And so at QUT, we're trying to navigate the line and integrating both of those definitions. So it's not just about our own future generation, but also the, the future generations of all species. So I think, um, you know, there's a tendency to either be around environmental sustainability or about sustainable development. And of course, the, the SDGs, of which many universities have, um, I guess, aligned their purpose um, in this domain, really spreads across both the human and the environmental elements and the SDGs of what QUT, um, at what we're using to frame what we're doing as well. <clears throat> so um, in, I guess in the context of this symposium, um, I thought I'd focus on uh, SDG 3, which is good health and well-being, and what QUT is doing in particular about this SDG. And we've done a similar mapping exercise across all of the SDGs. So for SDG 3, we um, have a faculty of health and we don't have a medical school per se, but we offer undergraduate and postgraduate courses um, on all areas health, including nursing, optometry, public health and psychology. And as a consequence, we also conduct research into many aspects of health and well-being. And I'll give you a couple of examples of that um, next. We also have an international project unit uh, that runs capacity building programs in developing countries, um, focusing on health and education leadership um, and also private sector development. Many universities have a similar sort of, um, sort of unit. We have um, medical centres at both of our campus and um, one of the speakers today, uh, I think we'll, we'll talk more about that and the role <coughs> of those, um, those organisations. Um, and we also have health clinics for the community on our campuses as well, where QUT students can gain valuable work experience. And we run many seminars and um, workshops focused on health and wellbeing for our staff and our students. And finally, we as an organisation offer and deliver health benefits to our employees, including counselling services and health checks and workplace rehabilitation. So, you know, I guess an important part of this is looking after our looking after our staff and students and their own health and well-being as well. So I get, this gives you a, a breadth of a range of ways that universities play into this particular SDG. And this will look similar at most universities. I appreciate it. But I guess the, the key thing is, as I said, doing this SDG by SDGs is really quite illuminating at the, the breadth at which universities play into contributing to, contributing to achieving these SDGs. <clears throat> On the research side of things, this, this is where it gets really busy. Um, we have 29 research centres at QUT and we've mapped them against each of the SDGs. And this doesn't include smaller research groups, these are the designated research centres. And so you can see that we're taking, undertaking research across all of the SDGs. Um, and if we look, if you look in particular at SDG three there, <laughs> you can see that, um, you know, I've color coded things here by faculty, all of our faculties, not just our faculty of health um, are contributing to the um, SDG three. And that's a really important component of this. And, and I guess an important motivation at QUT is to, in, in, is to continue that interdisciplinary conversation that breaks down silos between fac faculties and between research centres and enable us to, to put into that interdisciplinary thought towards what needs, to, um, what needs to happen in order to progress these SDGs and the solutions that we need um, for the environmental problems that we have and other societal problems. So a rather, um, just a couple of examples here um, that really highlight the link between um, environmental collapse and climate change and, and human health. Um, and two people that have really shaped the, that, that national conversation. Um, first of all, we have, I've got a picture here of um, Lydia Marowska, who's been in the news a lot, um, which she, I think she was most recently designated one of the Times Top 100 People of Influence um, this year. And she also um, leads the International Lab for Air Quality and Health at QUT. Um, and this, in the last couple of years, she's played a pivotal role in um, advocating for the, 
the of building awareness around airborne transmission of COVID-19, which is relevant, obviously, um, to the global pandemic, but it's also relevant to the impacts of um, climate change and airborne particulates and, and the on the health problems that creates also adults and children. And the second person I have a photo of there is of um, our QUT adjunct professor, Hilary Bam Bambrick, um, who's an epidemiologist um, and he's focused on the impacts of climate change on in particular vulnerable populations and is a member of um, Australia's Climate Council. And so I guess that here we've got two leading academics um, that are shaping the conversation nationally and internationally in ways that are really relevant um, to human health and wellbeing, so SDG3, but more broadly to those other SDGs as well. And we're really proud of the work that um, these two individuals have done. And I could have included other examples, of course, and you would all have examples. So I want to just flip back now to education. And what, modif what is mod uh, motivating, I guess, our, um, our intention to embed sustainability in all of QUT curriculum. So, and basically it comes down to our students uh, seeking to live more sustainable lives. A large proportion of them are 80%. And they also see that universities uh, have an important role to play with achieving in achieving these SDGs. So this is a, a, a time higher education survey of 2000 students. Um, but when we, and we're about to run a similar survey at QUT, we're expecting similar sorts of numbers around expectations. <clears throat> so, and I mentioned this before, we have this um, embedding project, embedding sustainability um, in the QUT curriculum. So this is both a top-down and a bottom-up project. So we've um, included sustainability as part of our, our real-world learning kind of um, materials. So all academics refer to <coughs> this um, real-world learning experience and our vision for QUT graduates. So sustainability has been embedded in that. And our goal is by um, 2026, all QUT undergraduate degrees will include core curriculum um, that allows students to develop and apply sustainability knowledge and values within their field. So regardless of the degree that they're undertaking. Um, and this, some, some of our academics are asking why are we taking five years to do this? Um, you know, in a sense of eagerness, we need to get this done. But in order to do this in a genuine way, it's going to take time. Um, and we, we want our graduates to really notice um, the changes um, that we're making to the curriculum so that they graduate with a real sense of pride of, of what they've experienced at QUT as well. And we're using the SDGs um, as a framework for embedding uh, across all the disciplines. So this is a, um, a big gnarly project at QUT and it's a collaborative project involving all of the faculties and also the learning and teaching unit at QUT. And then the, the final element, and this kind of speaks more to our operational component, but it's relevant to the discussion today, I think, is our um, newly launched Green Labs program. Um, so we just joined the, um, the ACTS Green Labs project um, program, which is the Australasian Campuses Towards Sustainability um, program administered by them. And it provides an, um, a framework for, to guide staff how to, in ways to make their workplaces, including their labs, more sustainable. Um, and it, it cuts across uh, energy and water effic um, efficiency, um, sustainable procurement, which is um, obviously a big one um, for institutions um, of the size of universities. And our um, procurement team is very dedicated, committed to this. And it's also um, an important element of this is sharing equipment and chemicals between labs at QUT and, and possibly beyond QUT. So we don't want <laughs> individual labs to hoard um, and eventually potentially waste um, valuable equipment and chemicals that other labs could make use of. Um, the safe disposal of equipment, chemicals and water is an important component of this also. And the program, the Green Labs program, also includes an auditing um, component to, to ensure that measures are being implemented and that um, the labs and the institutions are being held accountable 
um, for their commitments. And there might be other examples like that. I'm really interested to hear what other programs um, our institutions have uh, kind of joined and um, are working towards. So that's, um, that's all I uh, thought I would um, share today. Um, I guess there might be time for questions now, John. I don't know if you want to field any now. Um, noting that I can't stay for the panel, unfortunately, this afternoon, but I'll stay for as much of the other talks as I possibly can. So I'll just stop sharing my screen here. Um, and I'm also, um, my email address was just up there on the, on the screen before I stop sharing it, sorry. Um, kerry.wilson at qet.edu.au. And I would be really um, open to receiving questions or if people are seeking materials, um, I'm happy to provide them to help um, other organisations and individuals in their work in this area. So thank you. So thanks, Kerry. Mm -hmm. Now, the original plan was that we'd save all the questions till the end, but because um, you won't be able to stay for that panel discussion, I think it might be appropriate now to have a couple of questions. So if anyone's got any questions, uh, if you're online, uh, put your questions in the chat or has anyone in the uh, auditorium got a question you'd like to put to uh, Kerry? I can see Norbert down the back and then oh, Scott first. Thanks, Kerry, great talk. Um, can you tell us a bit more about how, you're, how QUT is approaching sustainable procurement? What does it actually mean? And how does that cascade down to a laboratory or a group level? Yeah, that's a really good question. We, um, at the moment, we're in a, a staff training phase in relation to this. So our head of procurement has been um, developing, I guess, principles to roll out across the university. This is part of embedding sustainability in all of our plans and actions. Um, it's it's because it, it, procurement obviously touches in so many different areas. One um, element at which I've found interfacing with our procurement team to be really helpful, not only in relation to sustainability, but also in relation to our, um, our commitments again uh, towards, for example, Modern Slavery Act, is just that sounding board of, can you, can you assure me that these products are meeting our expectations for our organisations and our our commitments against in, in these areas. Um, and our procurement team is really quite um, thorough and robust in ensuring alignment with, the, with those broader set of principles, be it sustainability or, or other areas. So I guess the, the, our procurement team are playing a big role in, in educating our staff in our choices. Um, and developing those principles of which we will and will not procure products from particular organisations based on um, the standards that we're putting forward as well. But I, I, I can put you in contact, is it Scott? I can't see anyone, obviously, um, uh, with our Head of Procurement if you'd like further information. And I can also send you the particular action plan that relates to procurement also if you just want to email me. I think it, it, I believe that this is one of the most critical areas in that relationship. Um, with our colleagues in that space is really important. Thanks, Kerry. That was Scott. You heard you picked up his voice uh, very well. Uh, I think Norbert had a question up the back. Uh, Norbert, if you could just introduce yourself when you get the microphone. Yeah. Hello. Um, thank you. Um, great talk. Um, I'm Norbert Kinsler. I'm working with Model Research here um, at the TRI. <laughs> um, I was. Now, coming from the profit and the non-profit sector, uh, obviously there are a couple um, of, of different frameworks around. And one of the, the ones which I think I came across in the past, which cuts really um, close to both, is that the three Ps, the, peop the profit, the people, and the planet, uh, which has particular also um, an emphasis on social responsibilities. And so I'm just wondering, I mean, it's great that every institution kind of creates their own framework, but is there a kind of an, um, uh, an attempt to, to bring a consolidated, really simple, like three piece framework um, uh, forward? And I mean, you know, TRI is a stakeholder of four, uh, TRI hosts four stakeholders, so I wonder how, um, how they can simplify it and also. <laughs> mm. Yeah, that's a, re that's a really, um, really good point. I guess one, um, one framework, I guess, is the SDGs themselves. 
but you know what you're speaking to there is a much more simpler definition of that. I think a key part of this Norbert is for is around sharing and transparency. So when QUT developed our sustainability action plan, we transparently reviewed what everyone else was doing. We didn't reinvent the wheel. We had a look and we took the, what, what looked like best practice um, into developing our sustainability action plan. And we similarly put that out there for public review, including tracking our progress against, those, um, against that ac action plan. So I think sharing is really important. There are organisations like the um, Sustainable Development Solutions Network, like ACTS that I referred to too, that create a community of practice. And, you know, I guess any institution seeks to differentiate. And I would argue that this is, a, this is an area where universities shouldn't be competing. They should be sharing. Um, we've only got, we've got more to gain um, the more that we align um, and the more that we um, collaborate in this space. Um, unfortunately, things like the Times Higher Education stuff adds a competitive element. Um, maybe that's needed for some, um, some in the university sector to really drive forward with this. Um, but that's not, that's not the, the leadership approach we're taking at QUT. So it doesn't directly answer your question, but I think the more that we can learn and the more that we can listen to our researchers, um, our, our own leaders, our own educators. Um, to just today, I spent uh, an hour and a half listen, listening to a PhD defense on embedding sustainability in design fields. You know, there's, there's people actively researching in our institutions to tell us what the best practice is and the best way forward. And that information isn't, yet, isn't out there yet. So Kerry, there's a couple of questions coming online. We're starting to run out a little bit of time, but I might just uh, pick what I personally think is the most interesting point that this person's made. They're asking, um, what are the two most impactful sustainable, su sustainable practical actions that can be taken in a life sciences lab? And this will segue very nicely into our next speaker uh, turn, who'll be addressing this issue in a moment. But do you want to tackle that? Yeah, uh, I think it's a great question. And it's, um, it's probably one that we haven't, um, <clears throat> I guess, got the, I haven't got the evidence for what I'm about to say at hand. <clears throat> but I would say in, a, in the Australian context, water um, slash energy uh, use and efficiency. You know, there's, there's a lot of keeping water cold <laughs> in labs um, and, and, I, and, and also keeping office spaces cold. Um, and it, it, it uses an enormous amount of energy. Um, QUT's uh, co-investing in a um, solar farm out in Columbula um, presently will be operational um, from mid-year to try and reduce our, um, our footprint um, but a lot of that comes back to, to what we're doing in our labs. Um, and also, I would say the procurement side of things and, um, and, and ensuring that our procurement teams locally uh, and also centralised are really on the same agenda around this as well. <clears throat> Fantastic. Again, thank you so very, very much for that, Kerry. Kind of wish we had a bit more time for questions. That's okay. Thank you. I'll take, those, I'll take those two questions if you like um, offline and I'll, I'll answer them more fully too. So thank you. Well, thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, so now to introduce you to our international speaker uh, joining us, Brighton Early from the Netherlands. Thank you so much. Uh, we have a Professor Turn Bousema, who is a professor in the e epidemiology of tropical infectious diseases at Radboud University Medical Centre and the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, as well as being a member of the prestigious Academia uh, Europea. Uh, he's initiated several sustainability uh, initiatives at his host institution and is currently leading the development of an ambitious new academic travel policy in the Netherlands. So over to you, Turn. I'm mute. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be invited to this important uh, seminar. Um, I will share my screen. I hope you can see it. Um, so 
first a bit of a disclaimer i'm really not a sustainability expert um in fact i'm a malaria researcher and uh, this also means that i'm a frequent flyer uh, i used to be a proud owner of a gold card uh, of klm and at some point it started to feel uncomfortable that i owned this gold card although all my peers uh, were frequent flyers and also working in remote settings in Africa, where sometimes I had to run ultra low temperature freezers from generators really made me realize that um, some of the work I'm doing is actually uh, quite, uh, uh, quite the opposite of sustainable research. So over the last 10 years or so, I became increasingly concerned about the carbon footprint of my own work. Uh, I always felt a little bit uncomfortable about talking to peers about it because it doesn't immediately make you popular. But especially during the COVID uh, uh, crisis and uh, the phase where you couldn't travel, I really started to uh, reach out more to, uh, to colleagues across the globe uh, to talk about sustainability issues and how we can, in some ways, reorganize our research after after this COVID crisis that we can also not travel. So some of my talk will be about travel. Uh, but I start a little bit more general. So I'm working at the, at the London School, but also at Radboud University in, in the Netherlands. And I'm going to talk a little bit about um, very much like um, the talk of Professor Wilson about what are our sustainability uh, goals. Um, then talk about uh, free, uh, a freezer challenge we organize at our institute and why I think that's actually a relevant start and sustainable laboratories. And then I'll talk about uh, thoughtful travel for academia. So first, um, university carbon footprint. So there have been many of these efforts to calculate what is the carbon footprint of universities. And I think it's actually very useful uh, to have these efforts because it really tells you where uh, where are the gains that can be made. So my own university uh, uh, that has about 20,000 students and 5,000 employees uh, in 2019 had a total carbon footprint of about 35,000 tons CO2 equivalent. And that's a very large and uh, impossible to grasp number. Uh, Across Europe, it's estimated that academics uh, for their work, so not for their, uh, their personal, um, uh, personal life, they emit about five tons of CO2 equivalents each year just by where they work and what kind of work they do. So that's across disciplines. Uh, at Radboud University, uh, there, it was also des uh, uh, estimated for all the different scopes. So scope one is the direct emissions. So for our university, it's also uh, uh, burning gas for, for heating buildings. Scope two is electricity and heating, everything you purchase from, uh, from outside the university. And scope three is a container scope with a lot of uh, other uh, emissions, including the goods you purchase, the transport, etc. So it was useful to have this exercise because it also made uh, the university realize that scope two is actually something you can easily tackle. Uh, you can switch to different sources of electricity. And that's something that they did in the last two years. So a bit like Professor Wilson said with, with solar farms in the Netherlands, it's windy, some parts. So the university actually uh, constructed an, uh, a few uh, uh, or contributed to windmill farm and, and a serious investment in windmill farms in the north of the Netherlands. And that really slashed the scope to emissions. So scope three is actually more complicated. And this is a pie chart uh, where I just illustrate some of the main scope three emissions. One of them is transport. Um, ICT is a huge uh, thing, I think also for research in general, all the data you store, all the emails you send, that really contributes to a lot of emissions and also the buildings themselves. So now um, Radboud University really decided that to make sustainability a trademark. So they had a, a few campaigns that were not appreciated by, uh, by all. Um, so the slogan of the university is now you have a part to play and they really want to focus on bringing in students who want to work on sustainability or on large societal efforts. And this was at the bottom, you see one of the, the uh, adverts they had about um, sustainability and sustainable development goals in a general way. This also actually resulted in quite some criticism because they 
felt that, or outsiders felt that the university made all of the scientists sort of climate activists. And they said, is this needed or should these people be impartial? Uh, uh, the board of directors said there's no impartiality uh, when it comes to climate change. It's just something we have to tackle and climate change, but also sustainability. So they really said we, we stick to this um, idealistic focus and idealistic trademark. So then they defined 11 uh, key areas of activity, and I'm not going to go through all of them. Uh, but the first two, I think, are interesting. Um, sustainability integrated in ed education. So as of this year, all students will have sustainability as part of their curriculum, whether you're studying astronomy or classical languages, there will be an element of sustainability in your coursework, which I think is a, is a nice way of, of making uh, it very clear that all, uh, all, all uh, disciplines have a role to play. Societal impact of research is very much like the sustainability development, uh, sustainable development goals that were already mentioned. And then I'm going to talk about two initiatives about energy management and uh, sustainable uh, mobility. So one of the things that I think really works quite well at Radboud University is that there is uh, there are three uh, full-time uh, sustainability officers, um, and there's also a living lab where, as an employee, you can ask questions about sustainability, and then together with some uh, researchers, those questions are turned into research projects. Students are found to uh, make that into their master's thesis, and then some of the findings are actually implemented and one of the most um, uh, exciting and in a way inspiring examples that I've heard from the last two years is that one um, group of pharmacists said how much uh, in how much medication do we actually uh, throw away because all of the all of the pills are actually in, in strips for individual patients and can we not somehow improve that and then uh, uh, a student worked on that and found out that actually on an annual basis, 3 million euro on medication is wasted. And they're now really changing the way they distribute drugs. So this was one of these living lab initiatives that came with a question and now is being turned into policy. So now my two initiatives, uh, electricity consumption and thoughtful travel. And electricity consumption, I, I consider like a, a starting point because it's easy, everyone feels you can do something about it. It's easy to measure. Thoughtful travel and uh, air travel is a lot more uncomfortable and a lot more difficult. So let's start with electricity consumption. So uh, chemical fume hoods are really um, uh, very important uses of uh, electricity. And there are ways of actually making sure that you don't uh, waste energy there. The other one is ultra low temperature freezers. So at my university medical center, we have almost 200 ultra low temperature freezers, often referred to as minus 80 freezers. Um, and I, um, I read that in the US, there are half a million of these freezers in universities, at companies. And one single freezer uh, uses as much energy as an American household. It's about two uh, Dutch households. So it's really quite an, uh, an energy um, uh, heavy piece of equipment. And what's very important that you initially, you may feel that minus 70 or minus 80 doesn't make such a difference, but the difference between minus 70 degrees Celsius or minus 80 degrees Celsius really means 25 to 35% extra electricity use. And what's striking is that until the 1980s, um, uh, the temperatures of these freezers were actually minus 65 and minus 70. And minus 60 is a critical temperature uh, where you really have a, a crystal formation that is, uh, that is different from lower or higher temperatures. But minus 80 is actually not one of these critical temperatures. And what is very obvious is that most of the samples, including RNA, that is, is the uh, one of the uh, materials that I work with a lot, is actually perfectly stable at minus 70. You don't need minus 80. 
So what we did as a small initiative, we gathered uh, experiences from across the globe of people who switched their freezers to minus 70 instead of minus 80. Um, what did they store? What were their findings? Uh, do they feel it's safe? And we made a document and that document is freely available to everyone. And with that document, we launched uh, a freezer challenge at our universities. So I um, asked uh, an artist from Belgium to make this beautiful bronze penguin that labs could win if they, uh, uh, we just had a scoring system and the scoring system was based on discarding samples, old samples, uh, replacing old freezers because old freezers really use a lot more energy than uh, new freezers um, and change the temperature setting where possible to minus 70. And this was, this sounded like an easy initiative, but it actually came down to approaching a lot of people in person, organizing a webinar, um, and really aggressively uh, uh, approaching people to make sure that they um, they signed up for the challenge. But in the end, it was quite a success. So after three months, more than a hundred thousand samples were discarded. The oldest sample was from 1988. Uh, completely useless. Uh, many of the freezers are full of samples we really don't use anymore. Uh, 34 freezers were retired or temperature settings were changed. I was hoping for more, but already with this initiative, we saved 10,000 euro in electricity bills every year, and we avoided 45 tons of CO2, which is about the same as 25 return flights from Amsterdam to New York. And I think those easy examples really make people realize that this was a super simple thing to do. And it already really has um, a small but meaningful impact. Now, freezers is not everything. And we now signed up uh, to leave the laboratory efficiency assessment framework, something that uh, Martin Farley is one of the spearheaders uh, at UCL in London. And that really helps you to measure CO2 and also see where you can make the, the biggest gains in your lab in terms of um, recycling waste. Um, um, and it really goes beyond electricity use. So this is the next step. And we just started the pilot, and it all looks very good. So I hope we will have many more initiatives. So now I switch to the, the more complicated topic, but also the one that I really hope I will I can play a role in is thoughtful travel. So um, I'm part also of the Young Academy of the Royal Academy of Sciences in the Netherlands. Um, it's easy to be young in science. <laughs> I'm not that young anymore. Um, but um, there, um, there was an effort to estimate what proportion of uh, CO2 emissions of different universities in the Netherlands is actually uh, attributable to uh, international flying. And it really was quite substantial. So for Erasmus University in Rotterdam, 27% of the entire CO2, uh, the entire carbon footprint was due to international travel. Now, we've all been frustrated about not being able to travel. I think many of us are during the COVID crisis, but it also really allowed us to think about uh, what is actually the carbon footprint of, for instance, academic conferences. And this map is one is a map I generated for my own um, annual conference of the American Society for Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. And that single three-day conference um, included uh, 45 million kilometers in air travel, uh, which is the same as 58 times to the moon and back. For a conference that is very useful, but it was also organized uh, uh, quite efficiently online and perhaps we don't need it every year. So virtual conferences, there are many estimates, but often it's like 1000, perhaps 3000 times um, uh, more sustainable in terms of CO2 emissions compared to in-person conferences. So this is conferences. And I think there's a lot been has been written about conferences, but I now also started approaching research funders because in a way conferencing is one thing, but um, uh, just work travel and even the practices involved in bringing in research grants are really not that sustainable. So this is a map for two European funders, European Research Council and a 
uh, 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 trial um, uh, funder for uh, trials in tropical infectious diseases or in, or in tropical diseases. And they fly in candidates for research grants from Japan, from Australia. You see some people from Australia for a 15 or 20 minute interview for their um, grants that they may or may not get. And I think this is something that I really think can change and should actually change. So we're now working with funders to say, how can you reduce your carbon footprint, but also how can you help universities to achieve their, um, uh, their uh, sustainability uh, uh, goals. So now in Nijmegen, we started uh, uh, a new travel policy and this will also have a national um, element. And we do it in three steps because it's something that is really uncomfortable because uh, international travel and international collaboration is really key to academic efforts. It's also something we enjoy. Um, so we started with a bottom up initiative. So we started with a, a, a travel pledge where people say after the COVID um, pandemic, I will uh, travel less and I'll be more thoughtful, more considerate about my travel. Um, that has so far had uh, 2000 researchers from across the globe uh, signing the petition. We started these discussions with uh, research uh, funders and we now um, have a, a challenge at our university where we ask different departments to define their own travel plan. It has to be ambitious. They want, they have to reduce their travel. It has to be fair in the sense that junior people perhaps benefit more from international experiences and the senior people are the frequent travelers. And it has to be inspiring in the sense that you can really monitor and share progress and you can celebrate successes. And for that, we uh, have another statue, this time uh, a kiwi, the non-flying bird that I think you know much better than I do. Um, and that's the first step. The second step, I'm really um, enthusiastic about it. It's really going to be quite ambitious because we know this has pushback. And this uh, image to the left of the, the woman on the bike, that is the typical image of um, a progressive um, uh, left-wing uh, Dutch citizen on a cargo bike. Um, and you have the senior people who are actually quite opposed to being uh, told what to do. So what we will do will not ho hold any referendum or any polls because I don't think that's super useful, but instead we will have a citizen consultation where we will pick 50 scientists randomly. We will make sure there's a good representation of senior people and also very junior people. And we pay them um, with a good meal and with some compensation for their time lost to spend a few evenings talking about how can we reduce travel. There is a need to reduce travel, so they cannot say we don't feel we have to reduce uh, travel. There is a need to do that. They can come up with the best uh, ideas of how to do that. And they can come up with clear recommendations. And the board of directors has already indicated that they will accept these recommendations. Uh, for some of them, they may change them a bit, but they will take it very seriously. And this is... Um, uh, a, a board or this is a, a group of uh, citizens so, and citizens here means academics who really have a say in how the uh, the, uh, uh, the 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 travel uh, policy will be of the university so that's the second step uh, and i think it could be a very important step to also make sure you get um, uh, support from people and then the third step is a top-down travel policy. So already we implement, implemented a system or we're about to implement a system where um, people can no longer book their own tickets. They have to book their tickets through a travel agent. Um, very soon there will be only reimbursement for low carbon travel. So you can no longer fly to London unless you really have a very strong justification for that. Otherwise you have to take the train uh, to, uh, to London. Um, and 
in that way, we will slowly uh, work towards, um, or quite rapidly work towards uh, a new mindset when it comes to academic travel. And then there will be the implement the measures from the uh, citizen consultation. So with that, we hope that um, within the next year or perhaps 18 months, we'll really have a very ambitious travel policy that will allow us to reduce uh, those scope three emissions when it comes to uh, transport. And with that, I've given a few examples and um, my personal considerations uh, being involved in sustainability efforts in uh, Nijmegen now for, uh, for about two years is that bottom up initiatives are really important, but in a way, if we take the climate crisis seriously, we cannot only rely on bottom up initiatives. So there has to be support from higher up. Um, focus on really relevant gains. So sometimes you have these very nice initiatives where people um, are collecting uh, garbage uh, on campus. I don't think those are the, the largest gains. So you really have to focus on the, on the relevant gains and make sure you have local enthusiasts. But what really helps is to also have some financial su support. So the three uh, full-time sustainability officers here in Nijmegen really help in making um, initiatives work. And with that, I think I spent my 20 minutes. Thank you for listening. Uh, so thanks, Turn. That's that's great, and uh, I, I found found that really quite inspirational. But also uh, really pleased the way you're able to bring in some very practical examples of things that you've been doing. So um, in the interest of time, we're going to reserve uh, questions to the panel discussion uh, at the end. So um, we'll move on to our next presentation. And it's interesting that you talked about, um, Turn, you talked about sustainability champions. And we're going to ask uh, Hayley Candler, who is one of our own sustainability champions, to uh, uh, take the floor for the next session. So Hayley um, heads up the TRI Sustainability Committee. Um, she's been a clinical trial assistant uh, for the Australian Clinical Trials Network. Uh, here at on the PA campus. Previously, she worked as a research officer at the University of New South Wales and has been in and around uh, medical research institutes for a bit over 10 years. And she's, she's a founding member of the uh, Sustainability Committee here at TR, TRI and is passionate about finding workable solutions to everyday environmental problems. So thanks, Hayley. Great, thank you so much, John. Okay. And thanks also to Turner. Okay. Now, firstly, uh, yes, I just want to say uh, thank you very much for having me. And um, yeah, but something that was really, really lovely to discover um, as I was preparing this presentation was actually kind of undertaking a little bit of an audit uh, of the activities of the TRI Sustainability Committee in really quite our short life um, being formed in mid-2019 was I found there was actually so much to talk about. I had to significantly cut down uh, my presentation today to be able to, um, yeah, to keep to time. So that was, that was really, really lovely to reflect upon. And I do feel very, very proud um, to represent the uh, Sustainability Committee and be able to talk to you about what we've been doing on a real grassroots sort of level uh, in this time. So uh, I'm sure that I'm not alone uh, in those of us who work here at the TRI, um, feeling quite blessed to work within this state-of-the-art research facility. Uh, and I think if we weren't able to establish some leadership in the area of sustainability here, uh, it would not only be a shame and quite a wasted opportunity. Um, but in this day and age, I would say arguably irresponsible. Uh, but fortunately, we are headed by partners who are committed to conducting research in a sustainable manner, uh, with sustainability, in fact, prioritised in the overall strategic plan for TRI. Uh, so to build upon some of the terrific measures that were already in place here, which I will be addressing, uh, the TRI Sustainability Committee was established. So who are we? 
I would describe us as being a group of quite eco-conscious, uh, we're primarily volunteer members uh, representing TRI, UQ, QUT and MARTA Research. Uh, and we responded to an open expression of interest uh, via email to form the committee, uh, as I mentioned before, in mid-2019. Uh, we're a subcommittee of the TRI Workplace Health and, uh, Health and Safety Committee, which reports to the executive leadership team. And in addition to having the Institute partners represented in our membership, uh, we've also ensured that our members represent TRI purchasing, building operations and core facilities. Now, at the time of formation, there was actually no specific budget for the committee, nor sustainability and environmental policies in place. Uh, so the committee really aimed to take leadership in steering the partner institutes to establish the infrastructure uh, that's required for greater sustainability here, uh, and prioritised, firstly, the identification of zero cost initiatives, and then those that required uh, capital investment, with a budget actually put in place in 2020. So getting on to our initiatives, I would say arguably the most significant uh, of our initiatives to date has been our uh, commingled recycling introduction to the building. Now, mercifully, for those of us who are so dedicated to this cause, establishing building-wide commingled re recycling was identified as a much more economically viable option with our waste contractor than it had been in the past. Now, the introduction of this recycling was quite the effort, uh, involving a full review of the contracted supply of waste bins to the entire building, then consultation with the cleaning team who were taking so much responsibility for this, uh, with new procedures drafted for them, and then, of course, the creation of building-wide signage. Uh, it was then put into action in all of our tea rooms in mid-2021. Now, another quite mammoth effort from everyone involved uh, was our entry of a TRI team into the Brisbane City Council Love to Ride Challenge in 2020, uh, requiring each team's registrant to log their ride times for the month of September. Uh, we promoted the challenge via the building's LED screens, notice boards and weekly newsletter. And I'm very pleased to say we won. So we took out the challenges 500 to 1,999 staff member category and our team achieved a combined cycling distance of 12,167 kilometres for one month, uh, saving 954 kilograms in greenhouse gas emissions. And then we celebrated with a very well-earned morning tea. We've also initiated some rather significant changes to our procurement. Uh, we've firstly had the building switch to dishwasher tablets with soluble packaging, uh, which was a welcome change to tablets with wrappers that were only suitable for landfill. And we've also switched to the use of carbon neutral paper for all of, all of our photocopying and printing. And a particularly heartening aspect of that change was that the product that we switched to was in fact cheaper than the product we were originally using. We use an estimated 2,300 reams of paper per year and now save approximately $3,000 in paper expenditure. And this adds to the already widespread paper and cardboard recycling that we had in place here, and also means that we're actively investing in paper mills, uh, which use biomass, wind and hydropower. And going back to the tea rooms, uh, we've also initiated the switch to Earth Choice dishwashing liquid, which I noticed today is also palm, palm olive, uh, but both of which are contained within 100% recycled plastic bottles. And again, uh, we found that this switch was uh, to a product that was cheaper than the one that was originally in use. Very, very encouraging. Now, the committee has also signed up with, uh, with TerraCycle for in its involvement in, uh, sorry, for involvement in its writing instruments recycling program. Now, this program allows organisations to accumulate and redeem uh, credit points towards charitable cash donations to worthy non-profit organisations such as Lifeline. Now, the instruments that are received by TerraCycle are melted into hard plastics that can be remoulded to make new products. And since February 2020, via collection points at each printing station in the building, we've, shift we've shipped approximately 10 kilograms of writing instruments in that short time. And accompanying the collection of these instruments at our printing stations are also battery collection points, where we encourage the recycling of a really wide variety of battery types, uh, including lithium ion, rechargeable, mobile phone batteries, 
and even those used in medical devices. We also have our lovely TRI branded reusable cups, uh, which were made available for purchase in May 2021. Uh, with the price set to ensure that they would be a very affordable alternative to other big brands. Um, and in fact, the rollout of this was only uh, delayed by COVID with cafes, of course, really not accepting our reusable cups. But as soon as they uh, gave us the green light, we went shopping. Now, uh, coordinated by the UQ Sustainability Office, we have the UQ Green Labs Program which is a network of environmentally conscious lab staff who promote eco-responsible practices. And we actually arranged to have a Green Labs representative conduct an audit of our lab practices here at TRI, which inspired a number of initiatives, such as the stickers that you're uh, able to see now. Now these signs, which are designed as you can see, to promote energy and resource efficiency in our labs, um, have been laminated and attached to all of our uh, relevant lab equipment. And we've also been doing our thing to promote uh, things such as proper freezer maintenance so that we can try to reduce the impact um, that having all of those ULTs in the buildings has. Okay, some of our other initiatives. We have our Nespresso pod recycling. So the recycling of these is now more consistent across levels with pod collection buckets present in each tea room. It's also a bit better promoted than it used to be, um, with us building upon the existing presence of Nespresso machines in each tea room uh, and the pods being available for sale from reception. Now, with regard to waste reduction at events that are hosted here, uh, we used Melbourne Cup 2020, uh, the lunch that we have for that each year, as an opportunity to manage event catering in a much more eco-friendly way. Uh, we had dedicated bins added to the tea rooms uh, for the disposal of food scraps and the compostable food and drink packaging products that we introduced to that particular event, um, as well as having some dedicated bins for bottles and can collection as well. Uh, in 2021, again, in light of COVID, uh, this was an outdoor-based event, uh, but we did ensure that we had uh, bins in the breezeways for various waste types. We've used our access to TRI communications to promote environmentally conscious activities, uh, events such as Clean Up Australia Day. And we've even given tips on how to gift more sustainably at Christmas time. Uh, we've also used our access to communications to invite green champions uh, to assist the committee in whatever way suited them best uh, with a recycling week trivia, uh, inviting the participants to have their say uh, into what initiatives they'd like to see in the building. And we've, sorry, just trying to scroll down the notes. It's okay, I can probably say it off the top of my head. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, oh, sorry, and I should also mention that the Senior Leadership Committee uh, has given us feedback that they were keen to see a greater presence of the Sustainability Committee in the TRI newsletter. So we've made sure that we've risen to the occasion there and added more entries. Uh, with regard to uh, paperless meetings, um, so we have, again, uh, used uh, the communication channels to encourage paperless meetings and double-sided printing, uh, with staff induction booklets alone producing thousands of full colour printed pages in the past, uh, which are all now being saved by us going digital. Okay. With regard to plastic waste reduction, we're helping to reduce reduce this uh, via P2 non-contaminated mask packaging recycling, uh, which has been collected in the biological research facility along with other soft plastics. Water use reduction via the use of placards in the tea rooms and bathrooms, just reminding people uh, in the building to be water use conscious. And this wonderfully adds to the already existing underground rainwater collection tank that we have here, which can store up to 440,000 litres of water, which is then used to flush our toilets and water our gardens. We also have water efficient taps in all of our bathrooms and kitchens, while our urinals also have flow restrictors and sensor flushes. I think we've done a pretty good job of cycling promotion. And specifically so uh, via end of trip facility improvement. 
Now, we've actually influenced as a committee the installation of 30 additional lockers and the creation of additional storage space, basically enough for 20 larger bikes such as mountain and e-bikes. And this uh, added to the already existing secure bicycle parking, storage, staff lockers and showers uh, that we had in place to facilitate cycling as a convenient form of transport to the building. And we even have a bicycle repair station. Okay. With regard to reuse and recycling, uh, printer cartridges, uh, we've been collecting those on each level and recycling those via the Cartridges for Planet Art program. We have tip boxes being reused internally for non-filter tips, uh, something that the committee has promoted with great success. After a successful trial, we've had decontaminated discarded safety glasses being used now as visitor glasses. So these are available as spares on all floors as well as with security. With fluorescent light globes, they do contain mercury. However, we are able to safely recycle these uh, via partnership with the PA hospital. Polystyrene boxes. We just might have a researcher in the building who has a bit of an informal agreement in place with uh, their lab sample courier, lab cabs, uh, to reuse the styrofoam boxes that they supply to us, as well as with the, uh, as well as being able to reuse the cardboard outers uh, that those that those are contained within. Uh, we also do have Gene Search uh, reusing some of their branded styrofoam packaging. And listed here are the various ways in which we were already saving a great deal of energy via motion activated and energy efficient lighting, manually activated air conditioning after hours, our vast number of rooftop solar panels and collectors, Responsible waste disposal methods, such as diversion via incineration, recycling, and upcycling. The collection of garden clippings for offsite disposal at an appropriate collection center. And the reuse of some of our chemical waste where that's appropriate, such as for cement production. Okay. And just to finish off with a bit of a wish list for initiatives um, that are in our future with a desktop a uh, bin plan already very much in the works where we are planning to exchange our current bins um, with desktop washable bins for use in the future. And we'll most definitely let you know as those sorts of plans start to come to fruition. Okay. And should you like to get in touch, we would absolutely love to hear from people with uh, any inquiries, requests, inspiration, to have your say, uh, to volunteer as a green champion. So again, just with whatever uh, level of commitment that you would like to give or to even join the committee, we will gladly welcome you. Thank you very much. I'm not going very far. Be with me just another moment. Here we go. Okay. So now please allow me to introduce another in-person speaker here. Uh, we have Associate Professor Linda Selby coming up. Now, Linda is a public health physician and an infectious diseases epidemiologist. She's previously worked for Queensland Health in senior positions, including as Executive Director of Population Health Queensland. She has also previously worked as CEO of Greenpeace Australia Pacific. And returned to academia at Curtin University School of Public Health in 2012 and commenced in UQ School of Public Health in 2017. She's passionate about protecting human health from the impacts of the climate crisis and her research institutes at interest, sorry, uh, include hepatitis C treatment in marginalised populations and increasing vaccine uptake. Right. Over to you, Linda. Um, yeah, thanks very much for this opportunity to talk to you um, today. I'm going to change tax a bit now and talk more about um, what we can all do in terms of our advocacy for change um, more broadly. 
Um, so uh, this is, uh, I'm just going to briefly say why health professionals, why should we be involved in advocacy for change? Um, use an example of tobacco about how long and challenging it can be when we need to get systemic change. And then how can we build and use our power and then provide some examples of health professionals um, working on advocating for sustainability. So why health professionals? Um, you probably are aware of this, um, but health professionals generally, this is from the Roy Morgan um, professions, image of professions survey. And you'll see that the top three um, highly rated, most highly rated by the Australian population in terms of trust are health professionals um, and then um, followed uh, by or dentists and university lecturers also there. So that means that we've got a certain amount of credibility and power simply by virtue of the work that we do, which then gives us an opportunity um, to, to advocate um, strongly for change. Also, um, as deliverers of healthcare, and in your case also um, health research, um, you actually have a lot of power in terms of deciding how and what you actually do that will have an impact on sustainability. You also have power, or we also have power, because our work is fundamental to the health system, which is fundamental um, for the Australian population. Um, we have credibility in our fields, and that credibility can extend um, to areas where, where our fields relate. Um, we have very strong associations, um, such as the AMA, Australian Medical Association, Queensland Nurses Union and the like, um, which are very powerful in terms of the ability to influence um, decision makers. Um, and we are major influencers. But our focus is on provision of care or undertaking research rather than necessarily advocacy or sustainability. So there's that tension there in terms of how we spend our time. But I would argue that it's really important for us to, to spend our time, at least some of our time in the advocacy space for, for systemic change in relation to dealing with the uh, climate crisis. Um, if you didn't need any more uh, reasons, the International Pan uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Six Assessment Report um, that came out last Monday, uh, looking at the impacts both current and projected of climate change on, um, on, on humans and our ecosystems and providing advice on adaptation and vulnerability really kind of points to the urgency of the criti how critical we are at, at this present time in terms of the need to drastically um, respond by reducing our emissions um, as well as needing to do what we can to better adapt. We're not there yet in Australia or, or indeed in almost anywhere in the world, but in Australia, we're really falling um, behind. And in terms of our emissions, although our government likes to tell us we're doing really well, in fact, our, um, we're, we're only doing well in terms of reducing land clearing and we've fallen back on that. Our, our fossil fuel emissions have risen over the last um, decade or so. So many, many health organisations have also recognised this, um, that the fact that climate change is a health emergency as well as an emergency for other um, human systems, um, including the AMA, but internationally also the British Medical Association um, and also in the US, uh, the alliances of health professionals across the US have called um, for action on climate change and, and health. And the Lancet has now for many years um, had a countdown report um, that was previously head, headed by Nick Watts, um, who's an Australian doctor, um, looking at how we're traveling both in terms of um, our health impacts, both globally, um, and at various, in various country levels, but also in terms of adaptation and, and emissions. So there's a global report, um, and then there's a specific Australian report. And this, is a, this was the report issued in um, 2021, where Australia was issued a uh, failing grade. 
uh, sorry, and then um, cons subsequent reports. Well, that reflects an ongoing trend in terms of Australian Landsat counts, countdown reports. So I'm now going to switch tack a bit. You know, well, basically what I've been saying is that we're really facing a, a crisis that in order to respond to it, both nationally and globally, we need to make substantial changes. And many people have at, over time talked about, used tobacco as, a, as an example of previously um, previous attempts to achieve major change, although I would argue that a cutting tobacco is much less of a challenge than um, getting significant emissions reduction globally. Um, and also people have spoken about tobacco in terms of the influence of the tobacco industry in resisting change and drawn, um, uh, made uh, reference to the similar thing that the fossil fuel industry has done. But, but um, Studler and Kearney, who are um, health policy wonks, if you like, um, some time ago now, looked at what had happened um, in terms of the the tobacco, both the rise and fall of tobacco um, in, uh, in, um, internationally, and still recognising that while we've had major gains in tobacco control in Australia, it's still a major public health problem, particularly in low and middle income countries. But what has changed is that tobacco has moved from being a normalised thing, something that was considered just part of most pe many people's lives, to becoming norm denormalized, but over a 50 year um, period. So quite a long time. And we think about all those people who died unnecessarily um, as because of that length of time, but also moving from what was once considered to be a product of economic value um, to one of a public health um, problem. But also that um, they found that to the tobacco industry retained power long after tobacco is known to be harmful. And you'd also look at a similar, um, similar situation in terms of the fossil fuel industry, which is now fossil fuels have been known to be harmful now um, to our environment for a very long time, but yet the, the industry still retains a lot of power. And that power is maintained through reputation, reputation in terms of being economic leaders, um, through their personal networks, um, and again, we have a lot of movement in Australia between um, the fossil fuel industry and lobbyists and politicians. There's a nice circle there that kind of reflects those personal networks. They have they had a lot of resources that they can put to it. And um, whereas on the opposite side, in terms of trying to oppose tobacco, um, we basically worked on the value of ideas, the ideas that human health was worth uh, protecting. So in this, uh, in their work, they describe these different phases of tobacco control policy, and I'll just talk about it briefly here. But you can see in the turn of the century, um, to the, from the 19th to the 20th, the cigarette industry really consolidated, um, and the First World War then um, consolidated that even further. Um, but even at that time, there was controversies about concerns about human health, but also the morality of smoking. But then governments really started to promote both tobacco growing and manufacturing. Then they described the 50s to the 60s, and that was started by the US um, Surgeon General's report on the impacts of um, tobacco on health, particularly in relation to lung cancer, where people started voicing more concerns about um, about the impacts on health. But you can see that still the next two decades, there was very little movement in terms of tobacco control. And they describe this as regulatory hesitancy. So the regulators felt that there was too much more to gain from tobacco um, than um, what you would gain from eliminating tobacco. But then over time, tobacco then increasingly became seen as a social and global menace. And now we're moving potentially um, towards certainly New Zealand and some other countries are talking about um, tobacco elimination. So, but over this time, as I said, a very long period of time, and I think you could, you could also fo follow the fossil fuel industry probably in a very similar kind of timelines, except at the present time, for in terms of we look at the 
general public, the fossil fuel industry is not yet considered a social um, and global menace um, more broadly. So some of the lessons were that the policy change didn't actually come just from the ideas and from the research. And as researchers, certainly in public health, we like to tend to do very policy orientated research. Um, and it can be disappointing when we produce this fabulous research outputs that then fail to result in any policy change. Um, and any delays which the tobacco industry contributed to also advantaged the tobacco industry. And again, we see that happening at the moment in terms of fossil fuels. They also found that the policy change occurs after the solutions are made more consistent with existing practices. So in other words, when people started to do things differently or when the solutions were more consistent with how people tended to live their lives, then that's when the policy change happened. So the policy change wasn't leading in this case, what was leading was the changes in practices. And with changes in the balance of power, that is the balance of power between the tobacco industry um, and other players. So policy inconsistency can occur. So what that means is that you might have some aspects of policy, for example, you might um, stop tobacco advertising, but you still have policies that support tobacco growing, but eventually resolve. And these changes can be self-reinforcing. And I think we're just starting to see that really in terms of um, climate change mitigation. So what does that mean for us? I think changes at a hospital or at an institute level can have flow on effects to other institutes and universities, et cetera, through these changes in behavior that then start to become the norm that then drives that policy change. So what you do here at TRI can, is part of that picture. But it's also though that on its own is one piece, but the other bit is that health professionals, and I'm using that term broadly to include uh, health researchers, in changing attitudes and the balance of power is an important part of that as well. So how do we best build and utilize our power? Well, this, these are steps that I've taught about advocacy many times before. Um, this is my kind of rule book. First of all, you need to be really clear about what you want to achieve. And you might say, well, I want to achieve um, global mitigation or, or global reductions of emissions, um, you know, in order to stick to remain global temperatures at under 1.5 degrees Celsius. That's probably a little too large. So it's important to define an objective that is achievable, that you bite off a piece of the puddle, which is most relevant puzzle, which is most relevant to, to your work and your situation. Then establishing and maintaining credibility. And that, um, as I mentioned, as um, health uh, practitioners and researchers, we have already credibility, but that maintenance of credibility is also key in terms of uh, in terms of not not exaggerating, being careful to speak, speak truth. Building coalitions and alliances. I'll talk a little more about um, learning about decision makers and their influences and, and being part of that overall influence and finding the right people who can influence the de decision makers. That may not be us. Um, learning about your opposition. Um, who are they? Where are their weak points? Um, decide on your frame or approach and ask, and I'll talk a bit more about that, using the media and internet, and really critically engaging the public and organising. So building the coalitions and alliances is really key. And one, something that I've learned a lot in the environment movement is that the more alliances that can be built across um, sectors, these unusual, unexpected alliances, for example, alliances with the trade union movement, um, with alliances with um, farmers, you know, farmers for climate action and so on. Um, so that you're hearing from different voices who can speak to their constituencies uh, is a really critical thing. And I think is also a place for health and medical researchers to do similar, similarly. building relationships with decision makers and their influences. Um, so that 
Um, years ago, when I was um, head of public health at Queensland Health, I had this goal of trying to um, get a whole of government approach to, um, to uh, public health and, and prevention of chronic disease. Um, and in order to do that, one of the things that we did was to build a relationship with um, Professor Michael Good, who I was one of my PhD supervisors many moons ago. Um, but at the time, he was um, chair of the NH and MRC, but also very influential in the Labor Party, who was in power at the time. And he, through Michael, was then able to reach um, the, the Premier. I had pretty good access to the Health Minister, but the Premier was obviously key in terms of that whole government approach. So it doesn't mean that I necessarily needed to build that relationship with the Premier. It's about building those relationships with people who do in order to then um, reach um, the people that you need to reach. Decide on the frame and approach and ask. So this relates to your objective. Um, but, but the ask is really about um, what, is, what are the key things we're wanting the decision makers or wanting the policy change to be? Um, and then how do we actually um, talk about it in a way that people who we're trying to reach will relate to? So that may not necessarily be the same as, as ourselves. So sometimes it's tempting to always speak to, our, our, speak to each other, whereas we actually need to be able to speak more to people more broadly. And then engaging the public or other staff and, um, and what Hayley was talking about in terms of the sustainability initiatives at TRI is a great example of that, getting people behind it. And that not only has the impact in terms of getting better sustainability activities at TRI, it has flow on effects um, to people's communities. And that's a really powerful thing. So then just um, some examples. Um, so the College of Physicians, I'm a fellow of the Faculty of Public Health Medicine within the college, um, has been doing work on climate change now for some time, but in recent times really ramping that up. Um, and this uh, document was produced by the college recently, released last year, and it was from a, a coalition of medical colleges were involved. So there were 10 medical colleges involved in the production of this resource which was then there to be used for further advocacy efforts rather than just um, standing alone. And within that, that, that alliance of the 10 medical colleges, um, there started to become a bit of, um, you know, people wanting, colleges wanting to outdo each other, which is a fabulous thing. Um, so the College of GPs have released these posters for waiting rooms, which the, now the College of Physicians is considering uh, adopting. The College of GPs has actually adopted a very um, ambitious uh, 2030 reduction targets um, that's now pushing the College of Physicians that way. So it's really encouraging when we're starting to get all these different medical colleges working together and, and, um, and pull, pulling it, dragging each other along. And now the College of Physicians is developing a, um, an, a federal election campaign as well. I'd just like to draw your attention to the Climate and Health Alliance. Some of you may be aware of that. It's possible to be an individual as well as an organisational member. And one of the initiatives that they're involved in, they work with um, global green and healthy hospitals to um, work for individual hospitals to provide advice and support for hospitals um, to improve their um, sustainability. Um, and uh, the Australian Academy of Health and Medical Sciences produced, um, have made a number of statements, um, this one and also one um, during COP26 last year. But what I would argue is that I think we need to, statements are really, really important, but they can make a tiny little splash at the time and then disappear. What we need is this ongoing um, advocacy ac action. These statements can form an important groundwork, but we need to keep going beyond that in order to be effective. Doctors for the Environment, those of you who are medically trained is a great organisation to be part of. Um, and then I just wanted to point out within the School of Public Health now, since um, the, the global climate strike in September, 2019, um, we've had our own UQ um, branded banner. And we've now, this first time we had um, over 40 staff and students participate in the global climate strike. 
Um, for those of you who are even gamer, um, there's health on the front line um, where we actually try and blockade um, fossil fuel projects. Um, so I'd just like to stop there. Thank you. So thanks, thanks, Linda. Um, I might get you and Hayley to come up for our panel discussion, which won't go for too long because we're running a little bit out of time. But um, I wanted to give people the opportunity, um, either online or in the audience here in the auditorium, to ask some uh, questions of our last three speakers. So Tune, uh, if you're still online, I, I, one of the things that struck me was um, some of the things that you were advocating actually involved a little bit of pain and you could see that there'd be a little bit of pushback from um, some of the uh, people working in your university or your research institute. And I'm particularly thinking about getting the researchers to turn the fridges down to minus 70 or um, uh, encouraging people to fly less. They're, they're not just peripheral things. They sort of strike at the heart of the way that a lot of people have done their business in the, you know, for a very long time. How have you approached the sort of pushback, the resistance, those sort of issues as, as you um, engage with colleagues um, in, your, in your own university? And that's a very good question. It's also not an easy question. Um, I think for the uh, for the freezers and for the temperature setting of the freezer, it's it is possible to generate evidence and to provide evidence and to give examples of other people who change their temperature. So I think there, I think if you try to convince scientists, that's what they want to see. Uh, so that's how we tackled that, and we really brought in some experts to answer questions through a webinar like this, where everyone could just raise their concerns. So I think there it was relatively easy. I think with the uh, academic flying, it's a lot more complicated, because um, how do you uh, uh, how, yeah, how, how do you respond to a comment of someone who says this is bad for my career? So you have traveled uh, extensively as a, as a young researcher and now you're a full professor and now you tell me that I can travel less. And I think that is really challenging. So that's why I think this, uh, this citizen consultation or really bringing together people and not really focusing on the people who have an eco mindset would be really important and our experience so far is that it's mostly the senior people who are opposed to change while my initial feeling would be that the junior people have most to lose if we say we're going to travel less um so there's a question online from nairi um i might send this towards linda then she, she asks, it's a fairly long question, but, but she's asking whether better recognition and integration of action on social sustainability and social determinants of health might start to flow in health research approaches in line with the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Does that, do you understand what she's yeah, coming from? Yeah, I, I do. Um, so I think where Nari is coming from is in terms of if you look at um, you know, the social and economic determinants of health. What that means is that um, people of lower socioeconomic status tend to have poorer health for a whole host of different reasons. I think, Nari, where you're saying what, what, what I interpreted you saying is what, are the, what is the chance that that might start to influence what's actually researched? And I guess there was a recent example of that um, in, in the news recently, because I think the 7.30 report looked at um, the management of uh, people with uh, ac acute or chronic rheumatic heart disease in Dumaji, um, where there, I guess we know what we need to do, but we obviously have severe, probably systemic racism as well as um, health systems challenges. So, I guess when we think about the type of research, what research is going to address those inequalities in health versus um, just research that might um, not address inequalities. And I think if we are going to meet those sustainable development goals, it's important 
that our research does try and address those inequalities rather than just um, health in general. And that same goes for health promotion, actually. It's pretty sad um, that when we do health promotion initiatives, they tend to benefit the health of the better off um, compared so they can actually increase the inequality. So it's sort of part of something we need to look at. Every initiative is it going to increase or decrease the inequalities in health and social and economic well-being. I can see Norbert up the back. Is, can someone give Norbert a microphone? You might just need to speak loudly, Norbert, so that we can all hear you. I just thought, um, you know, there are also good news. And um, I remember when, um, when I started my scientific career, um, one of the first PCR machines came up and they were actually cooled by water. It was incredible how much water they actually used. But, you know, 20 years later, we have now very, very sophisticated energy, suffi energy sufficient one. So my point is, you know, the market um, regulates kind of, can regulate kind of uh, energy efficient uh, um, um, infrastructure very well. And I think uh, Scott mentioned that in the beginning about the question of procurement. So if the Institute sets target on energy efficient infrastructure where it's available, then the market will respond, you know. Yeah. I think that's good news. You know? Absolutely. And I have absolutely no doubt that the more, you know, widespread, of course, that uh, new technologies are becoming sort of out there in industry, um, the more and more affordable it becomes for everyone as well, which is, of course, a huge consideration. So, um, yeah, we're talking about things that were so much more vastly expensive than they are now. So, yeah, very promising. Mm. I wanted to um, ask you actually, Linda, if you can speak to this at all. I, um, I was really, really struck actually by those uh, resources that were up on your slide, the sort of posters around um, direct impact of climate health on particular health conditions um, and experiences, say, of like extreme heat. Um, are you able to kind of talk to how we seem to be going um, in Australia or internationally in terms of sort of continued climate change denial? Are we seeing a, a, a positive sort of change with less denial happening or more general awareness? Uh, it seems to fluctuate a bit, which is pretty sad. So after the bushfires, um, the massive bushfires we had 2019-20, um, the, the polling suggested that Australians were, their concern about climate change had increased. Mm -hmm. But then with COVID, that has dropped a bit. So what tends to happen is, and we did a bit of social research on this, we were interested in people's views about, um, like public views, we did intercept interviews about uh, climate, the environment and fossil fuel policy. And a number of people said, talked about the concerns for the day-to-day -day issues overcoming the concerns about such things as climate change, even though many of them recognised that climate change was an important ex existential threat. Mm. So when the bushfires are happening and people are experiencing the smoke and so on, then that's definitely a day-to-day -day issue or when in the middle of a heat wave or in the middle of a flood. But then what tends to happen with a lot of people is then that, that then those concerns reduce. And I think that's sort of part of our, in order to kind of, I think, harness the public to a level where we're going to get meaningful governmental policy change will somehow need to have to figure out, and I've been pondering on this a lot, um, how do we make this more of a day-to-day -day issue when people aren't just facing these um, terrible threats? And I, um, that's a bigger challenge, yeah. <laughs> and I think that's what those posters are about, though. They're about trying to make it more of a day-to-day -day issue, you know, make it like in people's faces when they're in the waiting room, um, you know, they can see these things. That's why they can be quite powerful. Yeah. and directly relatable. I think that's what I really kind of took away from those. Yes, yeah, yeah they're, they're really good. And when the College of Physicians, when I say not if, when, hopefully, um, you know, there's possibility of doing similar things, but amongst some of the subspecialties and so on to, to really, you know, target them a bit more.
I think we probably should draw things to a close. We've run considerably yep. over time, but it's been a great um, session. Uh, thank you so much for our, to our four presenters, uh, to our audience online and to those who've answered questions. There have been a couple of additional questions we haven't had a chance to address. A couple to you, Tune. I don't know whether you can see the chat online, but um, if you could respond to those, and I just ask everyone to thank our presenters.